This is confirmed by Father Duclos himself in a book covered by the imprimatur during the summer of 1941, Hitler appealed to all Christian forces. He authorized Catholic missionaries to go to the new Eastern territories. Quote, Nor has it been forgotten that, in France, Cardinal Baudrillard and Major Paul de Loup recruited the LVF for the crusade against Russia. Edmund Paris, the Vatican against Europe, the Wycliffe Press, pages 240 and 241. While the Orthodox Christians of Russia were being exterminated by the papacy, there was a similar massacre going on in Yugoslavia. Some of the many books that have been written about this atrocity of World War II include Convert or Die by Edmund Paris, The Vatican's Holocaust by Avro Manhattan, and Ravening Wolves by Monica Farrell. These books all discuss the murder of around one million Orthodox Christians during World War II by the Catholic Ustashi. On the cover of Farrell's book, we read, This is the record of torture and murder committed in Europe in 1941-43 to by an army of Catholic actionists known as the Ustashi led by monks and priests, and even participated in by nuns. The victims suffered and died in the cause of liberty and freedom of conscience. The least we can do is to read the record of their sufferings and keep in mind that it happened, not in the Dark Ages, but in our own enlightened generation. Ustashi is another name for Catholic action. Monica Farrell, The Ravening Wolves, Protestant Publications, cover. The mass expulsion or forced conversion of the Orthodox Christians to Roman Catholicism was on the agenda. All measures aiming at the elimination of Serbdom in Croatia were carried out under the slogan enunciated by one of the Croatian ministers. We shall massacre the first third of the Serbs, expel the second third from the country, and force the final third to accept the Catholic faith, whereby they will be absorbed by the Catholic element. Lazo M. Kostic, Holocaust in the Independent State of Croatia, Liberty, page 18. The papacy was still trying to exterminate Orthodox Christians in Serbia in the late 90s. The papacy used the U.S. as their bully in that conflict to bomb Serbia. The real butcher of the Balkans is the Pope and the Catholic Church, not Slobodan Milosevic. They are trying the wrong person for war crimes. Another Jesuit goal of World War II was to make things so bad for the Jewish race that they would want to return to Palestine. Near the end of World War I, the Balfour Declaration was signed, enabling the Jews to go back home to Palestine. This was to be their permanent home. However, many Jews had found success in various parts of the world and did not want to return. When World War II and the Jewish Holocaust occurred, the persecuted Jews longed for a place to call home, and many returned to Palestine. In 1948, Israel was declared to be a sovereign nation. According to Cooney's book, The American Pope, page 187, Francis Spellman had been the deciding factor in getting Israel accepted as a sovereign state. Why would the Jesuits use Hitler to annihilate the Jews, and then have Jesuit Cardinal Francis Spellman provide a home in Palestine for them? Watch carefully. The Vatican has sought to destroy the Jews for a thousand years. Quote, Behind the Zionist banner, there was to be found the ancient messianic hope for the coming of a global theocracy, as predicted by all the seers and prophets of Zion. It was to be a theocracy in which Jehovah, not Christ, was to be king. The specter of the creation of such a theocracy has haunted the inner chambers of the Catholic Church from her earliest inception, and still is a dominant fear. In Vatican eyes, therefore, a millenarian yearning for a global Hebrew theocracy represents a deadly threat to the eschatological teachings of the Catholic Church. When translated into concrete political terms, such a view spells not only rivalry, but implacable enmity. Avro Manhattan, The Vatican-Moscow-Washington Alliance, Ozark Books, page 169 and 70. On the surface, the nation of Israel and Palestine seemed to be a grand opportunity for the Jews to be able to have their own country. However, what has been the result of the Jews returning to Palestine? Since they were granted sovereign status in 1948, the Jews have been in one ravaging battle after another with the Arabs. Many Jews have died, just as the Jesuits hoped and knew would happen. With the Jews returned to Israel and Palestine, the Jesuits hoped to cause such bloodshed in that part of the world that the world would cry out for a peacemaker to come to the region. And who would be that peacemaker? Why, the Pope of Vatican City, of course. The Jesuits have long wanted to restore the Pope's temporal power. When the Pope is given Solomon's throne in Jerusalem, the long-awaited goal will be accomplished. The war on terrorism that originated September 11, 2001, which George Bush calls a crusade, could certainly aggravate the trouble in that region to bring about the reign of the pontiff from Jerusalem. And we know that, from the other piece that I've done, that that's actually happened, that they've signed over the ownership of all the holy sites in Jerusalem to the Vatican. And that, really, the Rothschilds were the owners, uh, and through the, Lord, the Balfour Declaration, and that Really, they were just papal court Jews anyway, so the Jesuits have owned Jerusalem this whole time, since 1948 at least. Now carrying on with the, the text. 
The Jesuits failed in their attempts to have a world-governing body following World War I. They accomplished their sinister goal after World War II. Following the war, the weary, aching world was conditioned to accept an international government, and the United Nations was born. Since the creation of the UN in 45, this so-called peacekeeping body has failed miserably in keeping peace around the world. Why? Because keeping peace is not their purpose, even though they continue to claim that it is. There are presently some 83 different wars around the world. However, it has certainly been instrumental in suppressing liberty-loving people. Katanga and Rhodesia are just two examples of nations crushed by UN forces. The UN has worked tirelessly to restore the temporal power of the papacy, its purpose from the beginning. We will look at one more of the Jesuits' purposes for World War II. It was payback time for the Japanese. In the late 1500s, the Japanese had welcomed all foreigners who wanted to trade with her. Catholic missionaries had been welcomed too. After a time, the Catholic missionaries became intolerant of all other beliefs. Unrest and persecution resulted and Japan became a bloodbath for many decades. Finally, in 1639, the Exclusion Edict was passed. It stated, quote, For the future, let none, so long as the sun illuminates the world, presume to sail to Japan, not even in the quality of ambassadors. And this declaration is never to be revoked on pain of death. Avril Manhattan, Vietnam, Why Did We Go? From Chick Publications, page 153. For nearly 200 years, the ports of Japan were closed to Jesuit missionaries who had sought to take over Japan for the proud Pope. Through the latter half of the 19th century, military power was used against the island nation. This softened her until the awful bloody conflict of World War II in the South Pacific, culminating in the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Japan was brought to her knees forever. Payback had come. So those are quotes from a book we know about that, that the Jesuits probably ran the atomic bomb scam out of Japan, and that, that served another deep purpose of theirs, uh, creating world fear and, and uh, creating the Cold War and the Dew Line and all kinds of other um, goals that they have set were accomplished uh, at that time. And we can go back, I can show you documentaries that prove or show to a high degree that in all likelihood there was no such thing as a nuclear bomb and that there definitely was not one used at Hiroshima or Nagasaki. One of the points that's quoted here that I have to agree with is that directly after the supposed detonation at Trinity, the first testing of a nuclear device, that was it was 20 days later that they had both of the other bombs built and delivered and dropped onto Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's just ridiculous to think that. There's no possible way or it's extremely highly unlikely that they would have been able to uh, fashion tw two more bombs, two more working bombs and two different pro two different types and that they would have risked that. Anyway, enough about that. The Congress of Vienna was a black conspiracy against popular governments at which the high contracting parties announced that it's closed that they had formed a holy alliance. This was a cloak under which they masked to deceive the people. The particular business of the Congress of Verona, it developed, was the ratification of Article 6 of the Congress of Vienna, which was, in short, a promise to prevent or destroy popular governments wherever found, and to re-establish monarchy where it had been set aside. Quote, the high contracting parties of this compact, which were Russia, Prussia, Austria, and Pope Pius VII, the king of the Papal States, they entered into a secret treaty to do so. Burke McCarty, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, Arya Varda Publishing, 1924, page 7. The Congress of Vienna formed the Holy Alliance, whose primary goal was the destruction of all popular governments. Popular governments are those where the government allows its subjects to enjoy certain inalienable rights. Can you think of any popular governments that were establishing themselves in the world and granting their citizens certain inalienable rights around the year 1815? And we see that clearly the Council of Verona, the Council of Vienna, and the Council of Trent, they state within their own doctrines, within their own, within their own publications, that that was the purpose of them, is to destroy and declare anyone who is not a Roman Catholic to be a heretic. And then you can see in their, in their uh, oaths that they swear to kill and destroy all heretics, meaning everyone but themselves. I don't know how much more clear we need to get with it, but that's pretty clear to me. Senator Robert L. Owen placed in the Congressional Record of April 25, 1916, the following statement. 
which shows clearly he thought the primary target of the Holy Alliance was the United States. The Holy Alliance, having destroyed popular government in Spain and in Italy, had well laid plans also to destroy popular government in the American colonies, which had revolted from Spain and Portugal in Central and South America under the influence of the successful example of the United States. Quote, it was because of this conspiracy against the American republics by the European monarchies that the great English statesman Canning called the attention of our government to it, page 9 and 10, emphasis added. Senator Owen understood from the Congress of Vienna that the United Monarchies of Europe would seek to destroy the great American republic and its blood-bought freedoms. Senator Owen was not the only one who knew about this conspiracy against American freedom and the Constitution. In 1894, R.W. Thompson, the American Secretary of the Navy, wrote, the sovereigns of the Holy Alliance had massed large armies, and soon entered into a pledge to devote them to the suppression of all uprisings of the people, in favor of free government. And he, Pope Pius VII, desired to devote the Jesuits, supported by his pontifical power, to the accomplishment of that end. He knew how faithfully they would apply themselves to that work, and hence he counseled them, in his decree of restoration, to strictly observe the useful advices and salutary counsels whereby Loyola had made absolution the cornerstone of the society. R. W. Thompson, The Footprints of the Jesuits, Hunt and Eaton, 1894, page 251. And what he meant there is to strictly observe the useful advices and, and salutary counsels whereby Loyola had made absolution the cornerstone of the society, meaning that they could commit any acts, any murderous, terrible acts, and, and receive absolution from the Pope. Thompson pinpointed exactly who would be the agents used by the monarchs of Europe to destroy the Republic of America, namely the Jesuits of Rome. Since 1815, there has been a continual assault on America by the Jesuits to try to destroy the constitutional rights of this great nation. The famous inventor of the Morse Code, Samuel B. Morse, also wrote of this sinister plot against the United States. Quote, the author undertakes to show that a conspiracy against the liberties of this republic is now in full action, under the direction of the wily Prince, Prince Metternich of Austria who, knowing the impossibility of obliterating this troublesome example of a great and free nation by force of arms, is attempting to accomplish his object through the agency of an army of Jesuits. The array of facts and arguments going to prove the existence of such a conspiracy will astonish any man who opens the book with the same incredulity as we did. Samuel B. Morse, Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States, Crocker and Brewster, 1835. Preface. The array of books written that detail the sinister plots of the Congress of Vienna and the Jesuits against the American Republic are numerous. That this conspiracy has raged since 1815 is a fact of history. We will show that this conspiracy is in full force today, and that it is the reason America is having so many problems at the present time, and is so close to losing her freedoms, or at this time has lost her freedoms. Most people know very little about the Pope's Jesuits. The reason for this is they are a very secretive society. In order to understand what the order of the Jesuits is, please consider the following quotation. Throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created, or reconstituted, and the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason, and conscience wholly silenced, they knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. The gospel of Christ had enabled its adherents to meet danger and endure suffering, undismayed by cold, hunger, toil, and poverty, to uphold the banner of truth in face of the rack, the dungeon, and the stake. To combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers, and to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power, to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the re-establishment of the papal supremacy. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor, professing to have renounced the world, and bearing the sacred name of Jesus, who went about doing good. But under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination, were not only pardonable but commendable when they served the interests of the church. 
Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters. They established colleges for the sons of princes and nobles, and schools for the common people, and the children of Protestant parents were drawn into an observance of popish rites. All the outward pomp and display of the Romish worship was brought to bear to confuse the mind and dazzle and captivate the imagination, and thus the liberty for the which the fathers had toiled and bled was betrayed by the sons. The Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe, and wherever they went, there followed a revival of popery. E.G. White, The Great Controversy, page 234 and 235, Pacific Press Publishing Association, 1911. The Jesuits function like the Papacy's secret worldwide police. They are very secretive and go to great lengths to keep their operations secret. They tell no one that they are Jesuits. To all outside appearances, they appear as normal people. One last author will be cited here. Quote, they are Jesuits, the society of men, after exerting their tyranny for upwards of 200 years, at length became so formidable to the world, threatening the entire subversion of all social order, that even the Pope, whose devoted subjects they are, and must be, by vow of their society, was compelled to dissolve them. Pope Clement suppressed the Jesuit order in 1773. They had not been suppressed, however, for fifty years, before the waning influence of popery and despotism required their useful labors to resist the light of democratic liberty. And the Pope, Pius VII, simultaneously with the formation of the Holy Alliance in 1815, revived the order of the Jesuits in all their power. And do Americans need to be told what Jesuits are? They are a secret society a sort of Masonic order, with super-added features of revolting odiousness and a thousand times more dangerous. They are not merely priests or of one religious creed. They are merchants and lawyers and editors and men of any profession, having no outward badge by which to be recognized. They are about in all your society. They can assume any character, that of angels of light or ministers of darkness, to accomplish their one great end. They are all educated men, prepared and sworn to start at any moment and in any direction, and for any service, commanded by the general of their order, bound to no family, community, or country, by the ordinary ties which bind men, and sold for life to the cause of the Roman pontiff, J. Wayne Lawrence, The Crisis in America, or The Enemies of America Unmasked, G. D. Miller, 1855.